as required by the laws of YouTube, I now have a pink light. Hi gang, so during lockdown my games club started a sci-fi and fantasy book club and one of the books we read was Xenos by Dan Abnett, often cited as being one of the best introductions to the 40k universe. After completing it, my friend Mira, who had never read any 40k before, asked this. Question. What's the name for the universe of Warhammer? Cue a lengthy discussion about how the world of 40k is, well, our world. Just really, really far in the future. I said that I'd write a short summary of the background for her, and when that went exactly as well as you might expect, we joked that I should start a YouTube channel and turn it into a video. Pink light. So here we are, a brief-ish summary of how 40k got to be 40k. If you're relatively new to the 40k background and all this is seeming a bit of a jumble, hopefully this will be useful. I'm recording in 2021 and we're currently at the start of the third millennium CE. This is the dating system we use throughout, the one we're used to. I also want people, before we start, to bear in mind the scale of what we're talking about. Most sci-fi franchises are set a few hundred years into the future. Warhammer 40,000 is called that because that's when it's set, almost 40,000 years in the future. And that's a deliberate choice. It means they could come out with something really diverse and different. So we're in the third millennium, M3. From the perspective of 40K, this is the age of terror, which is their word for Earth. From now until around M15, humanity spreads out from Earth, slowly at first, using conventional sublight spacecraft and generation ships. Progress is slow, and the new colonies have to survive as independent units, isolated from the mother world by up to 10 generations of travel. Mars is the first planet to be terraformed to sustain life, and then others follow. I'm going to reiterate that the next big change comes in M15, 12,000 years in our future. That's five times as far in the future as ancient Rome is in our past. In 40k, practically nothing from the Age of Terror survives. It's fair to assume that everything we'd recognise, cultures, nations, political systems, are all ancient history by this point. Between M15 and M18, humanity moves into the Age of Technology, but from the point of 40k, it's often known as the Dark Age of Technology because so few records survive. In this time, a few of the central concepts of the 40k universe are discovered. The first discovery is the warp. The warp in 40k is a parallel dimension roughly mapped onto our own, but instead of physical matter, the warp is composed of emotional energy. This energy comes from the mind of every sentient creature in the universe, each of which is like a tiny candle flame in the warp. These seas of emotional energy don't conform to the laws of physics, and so the warp can be a dangerous place to be. Looking upon it will send people mad, and exposure to it will twist and mutate physical forms. In addition, things live in the warp, beings composed of emotional energy that would try and devour any traveller and are constantly trying to break into real space. The warp is where a lot of the horror element of 40k comes from. However, there are stable currents through the warp, and since time and space don't mean the same thing there, a ship wrapped in a protective bubble of real space called a Geller field could ride those currents and achieve faster than light travel. At first, only short jumps were possible, skimming the surface of the warp, but the humans of the Age of Technology eventually developed navigators, a controlled mutation resulting in a human bloodlines with a third warp eye that can perceive the rolling currents of the warp and chart a course through them. With navigators, humanity can spread across the galaxy and become wildly diverse and divergent. Trade routes are established, space nations and star empires exist. Humans encounter alien races for the first time, and the first alien wars are fought. Aliens in 40k, called Xenos, are always worryingly, horribly other. Humanity's technology is seemingly capable of anything. One big development is the STC, the Standard Template Construct. An STC is a machine, or a program, or a small factory, it's unclear, that can manufacture a single device out of whatever local materials are to hand. STC systems are sent out as planets are colonised, making sure that the new planet can make vehicles, or life support, or weapons out of whatever resources happen to be around. They are the sum total of human technical knowledge, in a form that allows any lay person to benefit from it without needing to understand it. That's foreshadowing. The other development in this age is that of true artificial intelligence. Eventually this leads to a great universe-wide war as the artificial intelligences inevitably revolt, known to legend as the war between the Men of Stone and the Men of Iron. 
the men of iron, the robots, were defeated, and from then on, thinking machines were outlawed. Any thinking must have a human mind at its core. This means that the robot servants that other sci-fi franchises have are replaced in 40k by servitors. Humans, usually clones or criminals, whose minds have been wiped and replaced by simple programming. Computers have vat-grown biological tissue at their core and sometimes rudimentary personalities because of it. With the dark age of technology at its height, by the end of the 22nd millennium, humanity starts to suffer a great collapse as the warp becomes turbulent. Great warp storms reroute or shut off stable currents, and slowly interstellar travel becomes impossible. Empires and galactic communities become slowly isolated from each other, many unable to get the resources they need. At the same time, instances of psychic power in humans start to increase. In 40k, a psyche is a sentient being whose presence in the warp is not a candle but a great bright flame. They are a conduit for the warp, able to use the power of the warp to achieve things that look like magic in real space. Psychers have always been a part of humanity, and in 40k that's where we get our myths of magic and shaman and witches from. But psychers can be dangerous. Letting the warp into real space through your mind runs the risk of letting one of the things that live there in too. And without great strength of mind, a psyker possessed by a warp entity could damn an entire world to mutation and corruption as they become a gateway to those that inhabit the warp. Possession. Damnation. You'll notice a lot of religious language starts to creep in here. In 40k, there aren't really actual gods, but there are certainly things so powerful and alien that they might as well be. We said that the warp was formed of emotion, and those emotions flow together. As the number of sentient beings in the galaxy explodes, the greatest of those emotions, fear, anger, deceit, desire, become so huge and concentrated in the warp that they start to possess a great intelligence and compete with one another to influence the real world. These chaos powers are often called gods, but they're more like great, unknowable Lovecraftian entities. Still, dedicating acts to them in real space can draw their attention and grant great power, so worship becomes the word used. The entities that serve them can be summoned and possess people, so demon ends up being the term used. Great strength of mind can repel them, so faith ends up being the term used. There aren't gods like we would understand them, but because of the warp, religion and worship are real and powerful things in the setting. As the warp storms grow and humanity falls into isolated pockets, whole worlds are consumed by the actions of rogue psychers, or cults worshipping the chaos powers, or simply starve for want of resources or are picked off by aliens. By the 25th millennium, humanity descends into 5,000 years of stagnation and decline known as the Age of Strife. Ancient Earth, by this point known as Terra, has long used up its resources and descends into warring nation-states, facing hordes of techno-barbarian warriors using the remnants of past technologies. Every tool in mankind's millennia-long arsenal is used in conflicts from atomics to genetic engineering to psychic powers. Some organised states hold out, but for most of the period, Terra's permanently in a state of war over minute natural resources. It's into this world, around the 30th millennium, that the Emperor emerges. Nobody knows where he came from, but he's a psyker of staggering power and a scientist of unparalleled genius. An immortal who claims to have been with humanity since the start of civilization, guiding us in the background. That's the official line. There are other theories, especially amongst contemporary characters in the novels. From this point, we get into stuff that's known, though restricted, history in the 40k world, so we start to get a lot more detail. Also, background and novels are still being written that expand on this stuff, so it could change. I'll put this asterisk on screen whenever things get particularly contentious. As humanity on Terra starts to consume itself, the Emperor begins a slow conquest of the planet at the head of armies of genetically engineered warriors. Genetic engineering is kind of the Emperor's hobby. First of these are the Legio Custodes, his bodyguards, each taken as a toddler and genetically rewritten into a loyal, thoughtful, immortal philosopher soldier in a long and costly process. But there aren't initially enough of them to conquer a planet, so alongside the regular human armies at his disposal march 20 legions of Thunder Warriors, adult soldiers genetically engineered to be incredibly large, tough and aggressive. With the Thunder Legions, the Emperor sweeps across Earth and either defeats the various warring factions or brings them into his Imperium under threat of destruction. Yeah, it's called an Imperium, not an Empire. Don't know why. As a psyker of staggering power, the Emperor knows why the warp has grown so stormy over the last few millennia. 
An alien race, the Eldar, were at the very height of their power during humanity's expansion, so technologically advanced that their lives were spent in indulgence and leisure. However, the Eldar race are extremely psychic, and as their society grew more and more decadent, the emotional energy that was building up in the warp was slowly coalescing into a new chaos power. When that power woke up, the warp storms would be cleared, and the Emperor wanted to be ready for that. As the conquest of Earth reaches its height, the Emperor starts work on the next stage of his plan. Humanity was scattered across the galaxy, under threat from Xenos predators and ever more vulnerable to the warp as it slowly evolved into a psychic species. The Emperor had conquered Earth, but the Thunder Warriors were too unstable and erratic to conquer an entire galaxy. He needed autonomous, reliable armies that he could send out to all corners of the galaxy to unite humanity. He stole a measure of power from the warp, and used it to create 20 Primarchs, giant superhuman generals. And from their genetic structure, he created another army of genetically engineered super soldiers, the Legionnaires Astartes, or Space Marines. Though individually less powerful than a Custodes or a Thunder Warrior, the process by which they were made, by implanting gene seed into adolescent boys, and the stabilization offered by their Primarchs genetic structure, allowed each Legion of Astartes to be practically self-sufficient. They could continue to replenish their numbers as they went. So, that's the plan, and as the infant Primarchs grow in their capsules in the Vaults of Terror, and as the first Astartes were being tested from their genetic material, the powers of Chaos managed to breach the Emperor's laboratory and scatter the 20 Primarchs across the galaxy. This was late in the process, so there was still enough genetic material around to create the 20 Legions, though the lack of nearby Primarchs meant that various genetic issues arose within the Legions. When the fourth Chaos Power, Slanesh, was finally born at the start of the 31st millennium, with a psychic shriek that almost destroyed the Eldar species, the warp storms were blown away and the Emperor launched his Great Crusade at the head of innumerable regular armies and 20 legions of Astartes. The Crusade had a few main aims. To unite the disparate surviving strands of humanity, by force if necessary, to kill all Xenos found so that humanity has no competition, to impose the Imperial Truth, a secular denial of all religion. The idea is to deny chaos a source of human worship, and to regulate, capture and train any human psychers. But at this point there's already a spanner in the works. Arguably the plan had been for the Primarchs and the Legions to lead this crusade, while the Emperor worked on another big project, breaking into the Webway. The Webway is a subspace network of transit tunnels in between real space and the warp, built by an ancient alien race. If humanity could use the webway, then it wouldn't have to rely on the warp for interstellar travel. And if this, the regulation of psychers and the denial of worship, could all happen quickly while the Chaos powers were still reeling from the birth of Slanesh, then Chaos would be denied a power source in humanity, and humanity would be safe from it. However, the loss of the Primarchs screwed all that up. The Emperor had to lead the Great Crusade himself. So the Great Crusade sets out from terror after 5,000 years of isolation and stagnation. The first planet encountered is Mars, ruled by the Mechanicum, a culture that revere technology as holy knowledge. The tech priests concentrate on rediscovering great secrets from humanity's past, like the STC systems, without truly understanding them. In fact, innovation is considered an affront to their god, the Omnissiah. Thankfully, an awful lot of tech priests think that the Emperor is the incarnation of the Omnissiah, so the Imperial Truth is conveniently waived for Mars and the Mechanicum ally with the Imperium. The expeditionary fleets discover various lost pockets of humanity over the course of a hundred years of crusading. Some are advanced societies who have weathered the age of strife with their technological secrets intact, but most have devolved into primitive societies. Some resist compliance, or have fallen to the worship of chaos, or have been enslaved or mutated, and these are all destroyed by the legions. Slowly, as the Great Crusade expands, all the original 20 Primarchs are found, scattered on various human planets, and they are given command of their legions. Eventually, with the Primarchs rediscovered and the Great Crusade nearing completion, the Emperor raises one of the Primarchs, Horus of the 16th Legion, to War Master. Horus is to lead the conclusion of the Crusade, while the Emperor returns to Terra to work on the Webway project. But by this point, things have got a bit desperate. The Primarchs are all great leaders, but they're not really the perfect Imperial generals the Emperor was aiming for. They've all been raised in different human cultures with very different ideas of how to fight a war, very different ideas of what the Imperium should be, and very different ideas about the Emperor. Some see him as a great leader, others as a tyrant, others as a god. 
Many see him as a father figure and feel abandoned when he places Horus in charge and disappears off to spend the rest of the crusade in a laboratory. Many of them worry what their place will be when the crusade is over. After all, when the Thunder Warriors stopped being useful, the Emperor just straight up killed them. And since they've obviously been stolen away by chaos at some point, the Emperor, never the most human and caring of beings, is quite closed about revealing his full plans to them. Games Workshop's also quite closed about revealing its full plans. I'm piecing this together from a lot of different books. Eventually, using some of these feelings of betrayal, Chaos manages to turn Horus and half the Primarchs against the Emperor, and a galactic civil war rages between the Nine Loyalist Legions and the Nine Traitor Legions. Two Primarchs disappear mysteriously during the Crusade. This war is called the Horus Heresy, and there's a 50-book novel series about it, but in short... The Emperor spends most of it in his lab trying to finish the Webway project, a few Primarchs die, Horus lays siege to the Imperial Palace on Terra before the Emperor emerges and kills him, but is mortally wounded in return. The Emperor, Catatonic, is placed on the life support device known as the Golden Throne, and the Traitor Legions retreat to the Eye of Terra, a massive area of the galaxy where the warp and real space cross over. In the ten millennia after the Horus Heresy, the Imperium kind of devolves. It stays together, ruled by a council called the High Lords of Terror and a huge bureaucracy called the Administratum. One by one, the Loyalist Primarchs disappear or are killed in battles against aliens. The Great Astartes Legions are considered way too much of a concentration of power, so they're split up into thousands of autonomous chapters of around a thousand marines, spread across the galaxy and tasked with protecting specific areas or worlds. Because of the gene seed system, each chapter is largely self-sufficient, and because they were created by the Emperor and the Primarchs, they're also outside the direct control of the High Lords. After the Emperor is placed on the Golden Throne, a religious movement starts venerating him as a god who has ascended. Resisted at first, this eventually becomes the state religion of the Imperium, run by an organisation called the Ecclesiarchy, and is brutally enforced across the galaxy. Crusades or holy wars because of differences in scripture become quite a commonplace thing. As the Imperium becomes more concerned with heresy and the threat of chaos and xenos, the Imperial Inquisition is formed to hunt out traitors and heretics within. By the 41st millennium, the Imperium is a galaxy-spanning, authoritarian, fascist, religious fundamentalist, oppressive state, fighting to stay together against the threats of chaos and various Xenos species. It encompasses worlds so remote and backwards that they largely exist as medieval farming communities whose only contact with the Imperium proper is a tithe of soldiers every few decades, and teeming hive worlds with populations in the billions where everyone's a factory drone. The Imperium has no particular opinion on what form of government or social structure a planet might have, so long as it sticks to Imperial law and delivers its tithe, which means a lot of planets are ruled by autocrats, dictators, or a sort of noble caste. Any knowledge of Chaos or the Horus Heresy is ruthlessly suppressed, and most people have no idea of anything in history beyond the propaganda they consume. The vast majority of humans never leave their home planet. The Emperor has been a catatonic husk for 10,000 years, but psychers are still hunted down and returned to Terra where they're sacrificed to fuel the Emperor's golden throne, or to power a giant navigational beacon called the Astronomicon. The lucky ones might become astrotelepaths, the only reliable way of communicating between star systems. Harboring psychers, dealing with Xenos, or contact with Chaos are considered capital crimes, and if a planet is deemed too far gone then it might suffer the fate of Exterminatus, scoured clean of life, just as a precaution. The colossal, inefficient bureaucracy of the Imperium is intended as a satire. As the famous quote goes, whole sectors of space are lost or abandoned due to rounding errors in administratum tax returns. It's not a fun place to live, and it's against this background that almost all of modern 40k is set. That's the world that Xenos is set in, and the world that the 40k stories have been written in for 30 years now. It's so huge and expansive that many authors have cut out their own little sectors to concentrate on. Abnett's Eisenhorn stories, and the sequels to those, happen in just one subsector of the Imperium. Recently, Games Workshop decided to actually move the plot forward, the first time they've done that since the 80s. The planets holding back the Eye of Terror fall, and a great warp rift spreads across the galaxy, splitting the Imperium and setting loose huge chaos armies. One of the Loyalist Primarchs reappears and forces a load of Imperial forces back to the front line, as well as making huge improvements to the Adeptus Astartes. All that is currently unfolding within the game, so I'm not really going to go any further with it in this video. 
40K borrows a lot from other sources. The colossal scale outlawing of AI on use of religion as a tool is straight from Dune. The concept of chaos powers is borrowed from Michael Moorcock, but the way chaos cults in the chaos powers function is more Lovecraft. And the daily over-the-topness and satire is very heavily influenced by 2000 AD and Judge Dredd. The scale, paranoia, and ridiculous inefficiency of the Imperium is also really useful when you're writing this background for a game where any player might want to play any other player. There are tons of reasons why one Imperial faction might fight another Imperial faction. It's almost more common than fighting aliens. Finally, I should say that this is really only the history of humanity within 40k. I mean, they're the main protagonists and cover most of the factions, but similar videos could be made about the history of some of the alien factions. Those are definitely videos for another time. Thanks for watching. If you are new to the 40k background and you found that either useful or really confusing, let me know below. It'd be good to know if these things are actually working. See you next time.